Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, James, and um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this was a presentation I gave at the NLA, which was in uh, I was asked to respond to James's presentation. Um, I had uh, at the time spent uh, quite a lot of time retiling my bathroom, uh, and um, the um, I, which kind of put me in mind of uh, tall buildings and tall building policy because the tiles you can see there they are uh, about five by ten. Uh, so they're kind of, you could stand them on the edge rather than the way I've laid them. They're kind of nice and tall and elegant. Um, and kind of while I was, while I was doing the retiling, uh, I was retiling it because the bathroom was built in 1962. It had all sorts of different tiles in it. So it was work of many hands over many years, a bit like this building or a bit yeah. like London. Uh, and um, uh, so I've got a regular sized tile and I've got a bathroom which is um, uh, 1.8. Um, by 2.4, so uh, if I've got a, a 10 centimetre tile, that should be fairly easy to do. Uh, and then uh, as I kind of got into the job, I figured out I needed about 230 tiles, about the number of tall buildings in London at the moment, so I'm planning permission. Um, but what I hadn't counted on was the many hands over, over many years, so, uh, so as I started putting the tiles on, I figured out that um, obviously they got the trainee bricky to do the inter interior wall partitions, so as the walls meet at the corners, they sort of go that way and they come this way. And if you've got a regular tile, it doesn't fit. Uh, so I ended up doing about 150 cuts to my 200 tiles, uh, which really, really, really pissed off my wife and children. Um, so showering became a bit more difficult, to say the least. Uh, and one of the things I found out was, um, was that uh, in putting my tap in, uh, I couldn't quite get the grousing line right on the midline of the tap. Uh, and um, so uh, I had a very brief discussion with the rest of my family about, um, well, should I move the sink a bit and should they wait for a few more months to have a shower? Uh, and they said, well, actually, no, uh, we, we can live with that uh, irregularity in, uh, in our interior world. Uh, and, uh, you know, then um, as, as the weeks go on, you know, I, I do start seeing clusters where they may not even exist uh, in, 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 uh, in what you're looking at. Um, but I think I think the 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 main thing was was this like many hands over many many years uh, and uh, you know individual architects design individual buildings um, but you know the city if you kind of look into the history of, of, of a city it's it's never which is one of the things that attracts me to living in a city you know, it's never about one person one individual it's always about lots of ideas kind of knocking against each other and it's always a bit messy. Um, you know, and if you're looking for some kind of perfection, um, you know, don't live in a city. Uh, one, of, one of its great creative strengths of a city, I think, is that messiness and that kind of knocking against the rough edges and the things which aren't quite square or aren't quite regular. Uh, and I must say that's quite a problem for a lot of my colleagues who are town planners um, because they, they like things to be regular. Um, so I am a messy planner and I have a very messy desk at work. Um, and um, you know, it, it, I think, I think you know, it's part of the essence of, of city life. I think personally. Uh, anyway, some order in, in this thing. So tall and large scale buildings, they should be part of a plan-led approach, says the London Plan. And as James has said, I, I think generally they are in places where they are meant to be. Uh, and we did a piece of work on this, and James did, and uh, third party has done a piece of work on this, and they've all come to not surprisingly the same conclusion. So, uh, where are tall buildings meant to be? Um, this, is, this is 2004 plan, 2008 plan, 2011 plan, there's been consistency there, and it goes right back to the LPAC work. And the LPAC work suggested much the same things that I'm going to go through here. So, you know, it's, there's been a thread, a consistent thread about, well, how, how do you manage and deal with tall building location? So that they should be in town centres and the central activity zone, and central activity zone, piece of planning jargon uh, for, you know, the central business district. Uh, it was always something that um, got Boris's attention. Uh, central activity zone. And, it, and uh, I think another thing for, uh, I suppose, as a planner is, is a kind of an awareness of that kind of jargon that sometimes people don't, don't quite get. Anyway, CAS, central activity zone, central business district, town centres, opportunity areas, as has already been mentioned. Um, so they're the big kind of mostly brownfield, but not all brownfield opportunities. Opportunity sites. Um, these are the ones which were well, from 2004 
to 2016, the current plan. Um, but we're looking to review those and kind of look for more of those. Uh, and um, no big surprise, if you look at South London, um, it doesn't have a massive amount of opportunity areas. Does that mean there aren't brownfield sites in South London? No, there's lots of them. What it does mean is that we just haven't really looked that hard uh, for the last 15 years. So now we're trying to look a bit harder for that, for that kind of opportunity. And, and, you know, it's got to fit with James's points, uh, you know, are there tall buildings where there aren't tall buildings or even much developments? A lot of that is in that kind of South London location. Um, I, th I think there's all sorts of reasons for that, political, but also planning. You know, if you don't plan for something or suggest it, then people won't, won't pick it up. Anyway, we're, we're looking to change that. Uh, P-Town, so the, um, the accessibility by public transports, um, something actually that wasn't in the um, Greater London Development Plan. So when that was done about tall buildings, that, that was looking at tall buildings more as a, a sort of um, a, a townscape issue rather than an economic um, issue, which was a, a big, big change when Ken Livingston came along. Um, but I think it was picked up in the, the, the LPAC world. Uh, and so if you, if you overlay um, the opportunity areas, the town centres, the high P-cell locations, uh, you get a map like that. Uh, and um, you, know, you can spot, if you know London, you can spot, you can spot Romford, you can see Ilford, uh, coming south, you can see Croydon, uh, you can see Richmond. Um, and so, you know, but sometimes I think of it as, you know, sort of pavements outside a tube station of an early Saturday morning sort of pattern. Um, that you might get from time to time. Uh, and so where are the tall buildings um, within that, which um, James was, was talking about? Uh, well, if you, if, you, if you just map them, it, it kind, of, you kind of, I think it's kind of hard to see necessarily a pattern there. But if you, if you overlay the things I've just talked about, uh, what you, I think you can see is that most of them are in those locations. And it's no surprise, because if you're, if you're faced with the difficulty and expense of building a tall building uh, and the time you have to invest in it to get through the planning system and the complexities around um, the engineering, the architecture and the financing, um, you know, you're not just going to put them anywhere um, because nobody will... Can I just ask a question, Patrick? Slide back. It says nearly 600 buildings over 30 metres high. Is this 600 buildings over 30 metres high in the planning system at the moment, so not the... Oh yeah, sorry, if I, if I just explain, so James's methodology is buildings 20 over 20 stories, stories, and the referrals to the GLA are buildings over 30. 30 stories are how high? 20 stories so that's about 60. 60. Yeah, so... So, so this is 10 metres, yeah. there's nearly 60 buildings in planning, and 600 yeah. buildings, so there's 600 buildings yeah. currently in London which are 600 metres um, sorry, uh, uh, 10 yeah. stories all high. So we've got yeah. 600, yeah. and there's another 630 metres up. So we're actually going to double the amount of tall buildings. No, no, no. no the, the, this, this, isn't, this isn't an additional set to James's. James's is a subset of this. Yes. So uh, we've got in, currently got 600 buildings within London, which is tw uh, 30 metres or 10 stories all Yes. And yeah. um, now we have planning for another uh, 600 buildings, 10 stories all more. No, 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 I'm obviously not being clear. No, th this is it. This so, is the existing... so all buildings over 30 metres okay. as existing That's... are 600, okay. and this is where we know they are. Okay. So, so there aren't, there's so not another, building, there's, there's, there's not another 600 coming. So, sorry, these are the proposals. So these, these are all applications which have been made for buildings over, over 30 storeys in okay. London. Do you have an idea of how many buildings there are? 10 metres or more in London? Uh, it's about 600. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, this is, this isn't, this is, the reason we've got this information is because everything over um, uh, 30 metres in height is referred to the Mayor's Office. So, so we've just got a list of all those referrals. So, so that is a map of all the referrals that have been made to the Mayor. So I asked the question, I asked it one there are currently in London built 600 buildings built in London which are 30 metres up. Uh, no, there's, there's, there's a different map which is all the tall buildings that exist. Uh, okay, I'm not showing you that, I'm showing you the one which is subject to planning applications. Okay, but that's around 600 buildings built yeah. in Do you yeah. have the side of the village here? Uh, I don't, no. no. But it does, it, does, it does exist. 
And in fact, um, they did one for the um, Greater London Development Plan. So, so there's one from 1976, uh, which, has a, which actually has a not dissimilar kind of scatter of buildings. So, so if, you, if you overlay the town centres, the high transport accessibility, um, and uh, the things which in the London Plan says where tall buildings should go and where the boroughs have been designing their plans, where they have them to put tall buildings, uh, these buildings, as James said, are all these proposals for these buildings are in those locations, are predominantly in those locations, not exclusively, because you can probably spot some that are outside. Uh, and where I put the, um, the red circles are locations where the boroughs, and sometimes the boroughs and the GLA, uh, have agreed uh, that there will be planned locations for clusters of tall buildings. So that includes Croydon uh, and um, Barking, Town Centre is there, and also Ilford. So these are things in plan policy. Uh, and then, kind of early in the year, there had been a quite a furore about, well, that, that's all very well. And what, what, so what I wanted to illustrate here is that, yes, you can have a policy uh, which I, indicates where tall buildings can go, and that can be in a highly accessible location in a town centre. Um, but you, know, you still have the difficulty of the particular, of how that impacts on people, and how they will view that. Uh, so whilst you can have a policy which, which is driven by a planning logic saying, well, these are the places where um, tall buildings should be located, you've still got the, then the issue about how they should be designed, uh, as anyone was setting out, how they should impact on the ground floor, um, what uses they should be, what, what, what civic benefits they give. And I mean to the public realm, to the provision of affordable housing, to, to improving um, access to public transport. So 100 Avenue Road, Swiss Cottage, um, not too far away from where I live, so I'm kind of aware of this in the local press, but also from a professional point of view, um, a lot, very, very unpopular locally. Um, but this was a scheme um, which is on top of Swiss Cottage too, and if you know the oldie Swiss Cottage pub uh, and the sports centre just behind it, and there's the, uh, this, the photo there is from the public space. So the existing building's down there, and the proposed one is there. Uh, and this was a scheme um, which is built for rent uh, and uh, also had uh, a very good affordable housing offer within that, um, some of which was uh, affordable rent units, uh, some was discounted market rent, uh, and it was um, recommended for approval by the borough, uh, and their view was, yes, this, this fitted with plan policy. Um, but there was a very, very stormy subcommittee, uh, lots of people turned up, and, and were very, very unhappy about it. Uh, and it was refused by Camden's committee. Then it went to the Secretary of State uh, to an appeal, uh, and the appeal was won. And this scheme was supported by, by the mayor as providing um, housing, including affordable housing, in a very accessible location, uh, in a town centre, uh, and some, so something which is helping to address one's housing needs uh, and was considered to meet uh, Good design to be of a good design, and it now has planning permission. And you know, the question there is well, the building on the site at the moment is, is five stories tall, it's an office. Um, you know, it, is that optimizing the use of that site in that location? Uh, and personally, I think it does, but I can understand why people get very upset about, about that as being an outcome. Uh, and why lots of people will turn up to a committee and say, no, we, we don't like that because we can see it from our conservation area, uh, which is just located um, kind of around the back uh, of this open space. Uh, so I'm not, uh, in setting out the policy position, I'm in no way sort of demeaning or belittling the strength of feeling uh, that, that these things generate for people when they, they're appearing in their neighbourhoods. Uh, this, this was the, um, the Paddington Pole, um, which uh, has now become the Paddington Cube. Uh, and again, you know, in terms of, of a policy position, well, it's in a very accessible location, it's in an opportunity area, and it's in part of a very large regeneration area. Uh, but equally, you know, you can see it from Hyde Park. Um, that's the um, Brunel Station. Uh, parked at the front there, Paddington Station, um, and there were significant public transport gains from this in terms of the Bakerloo line and Crossrail interchange. 
but uh, you know, the strength of feeling locally, politically, was was a very very strong one, uh, and um, you know, it, it didn't survive that. Uh, and I think James's point about the level of scrutiny about tall buildings is, is absolutely true in London. You know, tall, tall buildings, I don't think, kind of get off lightly in tall buildings in, in the amount of public scrutiny um, which they are subject to, which I think, you know, is a good thing. Uh, I think looking at taller buildings in other cities, I think generally where they're done in London, they are done really well. Uh, this uh, was a strategy that we set out for an opportunity area at Vauxhall Nine Elms, uh, and it was basically to give a firmer planning guidance to tall buildings coming forward in that area. Uh, and it was, it was essentially setting um, a, a series of criteria for tall buildings in that area. There, was, there, was gonna be a, there is an emerging cluster uh, uh, in the, the red bit there, which led up to 150 metres, and then along Albert Embankments, there was a limit to about 90 metres, and then behind it, there was a limit to 70 metres. This was so uh, you didn't get things appearing behind the Palace of Westminster, World Heritage Sites. It wasn't, the policy doesn't say just build up to that and everything's okay. It says more about tall buildings than that. It talks about um, their fit with a public realm strategy uh, and also their composition and how they relate to each other and the wider cityscape. Um, that piece there about Vauxhall Nine Arms, in, in its own turn, was generated by a fundamental change that's happening in the city, which is its growth. Uh, and it's significant growth from 2000 as it goes from seven to eight to 10 million people. Uh, so this was, the, um, this was the old central activity zone in the uh, first London plan. Uh, and in the, so that was the 2004 plan. In the 2008 plan, the central activity zone was extended into Vauxhall Nine Elms. So, so the, the idea was it would become part of central London. A lot of the growth in central London is on the South Bank. Elephant and Castle, uh, London Bridge, Blackfriars. Not surprising because the, the biggest kind of depopulation of London was that kind of inner area, particularly around the South Bank, um, after the, as, as part, largely as a lot of the Abercrombie plan, where you know, people moved out of London. So a lot of the big population growth has been in there, and um, the, the idea of extending the central activity zone here was to get. Uh, other business uses going on down there, but also a, a greater density of um, residential, which would help fund infrastructure like the Northern Line extension, but also parks, schools, civic facilities. Uh, and that this area of land, 100 odd, 100 odd hectares, uh, previously occupied by sheds and by New Covent Garden markets, surely in a city going from 7 million to 10 million, you've got to make the best of that opportunity, and you can't just let it sort of slip by. Uh, and um, it, uh, tall buildings, you know, they happen in a context, in a land use context, in a bigger plan context. It's not, it's not just randomly, let's have some tall buildings. Uh, they're supporting all the things on that list. They're not the only thing supporting them. Uh, the majority of development is more mid-rise. It's much more harder to do the tall buildings. Um, so the mid-rise stuff tends to be the stuff that's getting delivered and is, is the majority of development coming forward. Uh, at Vauxhall Nine Elms, there was a, a tariff charged for development, all development, tall or mid-rise developments. Um, there was a, a set target for affordable housing in Wandsworth and in Lambeth, 15% in Wandsworth because they were paying for mostly for the tube, and 40% in Lambeth. Uh, and then for every unit that was built, there was a charge for that unit, and that, that helped pay for the infrastructure. Uh, and it wasn't worked out on the basis of, well, we need a billion quid, therefore you can build anything you like. It was a balance between um, there is a cost to support this extension of London, um, but it's not a cost that is, is going to be given away um, without any scrutiny of the kind and quality of place that you're creating. So the whole thing was, was very much delivered by the, the creation of a new high quality place, both physically and in terms of supporting social infrastructure. Um, and this was that, that plan, um, a linear park, uh, a park down the, uh, a ri continuous riverside walk, uh, connections back to existing communities. So this was the public realm basis within which tall buildings were located and, and would define the relationship of tall buildings to that wider public realm uh, and would also help you kind of navigate your way around um, this part of London. 
Uh, this is um, one. This is the plan that was done in 2009, and I'm just going to quickly give you a look at this. This was the plan in 2009 with the linear park running through it, the tall building cluster at the top end, and the Riverside Walk. Uh, this is broadly the master plans that have come forward. They're not exactly the same as, as that 2009 plan. That was never the intention. This is a framework around which other people can be creative and um, give their own positive input and, uh, and ideas. Oops, where are Here we go. Uh, so that was in 2009, and this is this year. So this is the first, the first parts of it coming forward, being delivered. Uh, from 2009 to 2016, you know, five, six years or so, that's, that is really rapid going. And I think it shows you what you can do if you have a positive plan, uh, a plan which is proposing things, proposing where tall buildings can go, where open spaces can go, where lower rise buildings can go. So it's a more propositional and directive plan. And that can speed up delivery of homes, including affordable homes, schools, uh, and you know the social infrastructure. This is again looking back down that route that I was showing. This this links you back to the river, but also links you back to existing communities in Lambeth who currently can't get to the river quite so easily. Uh, so they'll be able to do that. You know, it's good quality stuff. There is affordable housing in here, right on the river. Um, this is the beginning of that linear park. There's some tall buildings, large buildings. Uh, been to have a look around those. They're good quality. Um, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. And again, there's affordable in there. Uh, where you can see the grey building and the cars, that's all going to go, and that's all going to become um, a six-hectare uh, six uh, open park space. But this is the, the kind of first bits of that park space. Uh, and there's, there's a tall building within this, this structured plan mm -hmm. for tall buildings. Uh, so, um, so those clusters, clusters of buildings, um, they're generally where they were planned to be by both Chile and local authorities. Um, I'll just leave you with some brief thoughts. Uh, personally, to, to, in a kind of a way, I think this is kind of, as these things develop, it's kind of, to me, got a sense of sort of shrinking the city. Uh, because when you can't see where um, Rotherhithe is uh, or where other parts of London are, you, there's something over on the horizon and it's kind of not always easy to kind of get your, your, your bearings in London. Um, but, as was pointed out earlier by Tina, if you, if you, and this, I mean, I wish I could say that when we came up with a plan for a linear park in Vauxhall Nine Elms, we thought, yeah, it'd be great if you could, if you could nail the end of the axis with a 300 metre high tower. No. But I go back to the beginning of, of my presentation and tiling my bathroom, um, you know, um, you get happy accidents in cities. Um, even without tall buildings. Uh, and so from Vauxhall Nine Elms, you start to get a sense of, oh, well, that's actually London Bridge. It's not very far away. If you, if you spin around on this photo uh, when you're actually in sight, as I've done here, um, again, the, the bit in the middle will be the park, so you just get this view. That's the Strata Tower, another winner of the Carbuncle Cup. But it's actually, to me, kind of remarkable about how close um, Elephant and Castle is to Vauxhall Nine Elms. Uh, when you look on, on, on your map, on your phone, or even if you're very old-fashioned, on your A to Z, they're not that far away from each other. And I think tall buildings arriving in the city are kind of bringing it closer together and kind of connecting it in and giving you a greater understanding, I think, of how, quite how close uh, things are to each other. Uh, and, and just winding up on that, this is, this is the view as you kind of go along um, through the city. Uh, looking down the streets to the river of the Strauss Tower, and this, this, this one on this side is Blackfriars, so there's a building on, on Blackfriars. Uh, and actually, it's kind of a sense of this expansion of the central activity zone, for you, you know, want of jargon. Um, because you can't, you can't see the Thames, of course you can't, because it's down in, a, down in a bit of a cussing with bridges going over. You kind of, you're starting to see the city as going south of the river, as looking like part of, of, of the centre of the city, rather than something else kind of over there. Um, and, um, and, you know, his, his, um, this is uh, the Ontario Tower down in, in Canada Water. Uh, and, you know, the more tall buildings in Canada Water, you might, you probably may well have a view about tall buildings appearing in the frame of, uh, of Tower Bridge. Um, but one of the things that I think is changing in London, and personally I think it's changing for the better, is you get much more of a sense of the geography of London, the centre of London and the relationships of things to each other. 
and the fact that they're not actually that far apart from each other. Um, and finally, uh, to finish off, kind of makes this point and other points, uh, that's Vauxhall Nine Elms over there. The red is where the cluster of tall buildings are appearing at the moment. So as you go over the, uh, the, the old Homeford Bridge, you can see them starting to come up. Um, but they won't appear right behind the Palace of Westminster, so that World Heritage Site view you know, is, is, is retained. Uh, if, you, if you look at Vauxhall Nine Elms and you think about Old Kent Road, so that's broadly Old Kent Road, and if you think about Vauxhall Nine Elms, uh, Vauxhall Nine Elms has a waste transfer station, has a proposal to extend a tube into it, it's full of industrial sheds, it's got a big out of town, or had a big out of town Sainsbury's in it, it's got an arterial road going through it, two arterial roads, it's got an old gas works on it, uh, which is currently almost being demolished. And that's in Vauxhall Nine Elms. And if you go um, a kilometre and a half to your east on Old Kent Road, Old Kent Road has a waste transfer station on it. It's got an old gas works on it. It's got a tube being extended into it. Um, I must admit, the riverside in Old Kent Road isn't quite as glamorous as it is in Vauxhall Nine Elms. But you, but you can see you know, the kind of similarities for, for city planning and the opportunity that exists in Old Kent Road, I think as an opportunity existed in Vauxhall Nine Elms six years ago. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at with um, TfL and um, uh, colleagues at Southwark is, is making the most of that opportunity because I think Old Kent Road is, is you know, one of those 70 hectare sites right in zone one, um, which offers a massive potential uh, for the, the growth and development of London. Uh, and finally, because uh, everybody, well, quite often Nine Elms is, Criticised, I think unfairly, because it's not even finished yet. Um, it's kind of only just started. Um, I was I was pleasantly surprised um, because I, because I'm a, I am a Guardian reader. Uh, that um, <laughs> so I found a piece in the Guardian by Deborah Orr, and the Guardian's usually super critical of uh, the planning of London, how awful it is, uh, and how everything's kind of run by terrible, mean, nasty developers doing terrible things. Uh, and, and actually, to Deborah Orr's great credit, she had been down to Vauxhall Nine Elms and said, you know, despite myself. It looks like it could be, could, could work. Thank you.